uh, artistry of Denny Zeitlin and his trio, and a composition credited to Ornette Coleman and Denny performing and the theme Turnaround with its roots in the blues. I remember a Saturday at Monterey, California in the sun, a wonderful day, and the artist Denny Zeitlin was performing at the Monterey Jazz Festival, and he was just uh, beginning to record. He has a rather remarkable pattern and career. We'll get to that a little bit later. Meantime, he's taking intermission at the Artist Quarter in Minneapolis at 26th and Nicollet. Welcome to Minnesota Public Radio, Denny. Thanks, Lee. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's good to have you in the territory, and I have warm memories of that Saturday afternoon at Monterey. That was a special day. That takes me back many, many years, but uh, there was a certain excitement in, uh, in the Monterey Festival at that time that, in a way, isn't there these days, because that was sort of its, its early period of getting established, and there was a tremendous amount of ferment among the musicians and the people that came, and it, it was very special, I thought. I felt, too, that... Uh, uh, Jimmy Lyons was really getting his feet on the ground as organizer of the festival, yes. along with his staff and the volunteers. Well, that's a special environment, of course. Uh, as you as you remember that environment from your times there, describe it for some of us who really have never been there before. In in that oh, lovely let's see that. I think the time at Monterey that you're remembering my being there, because I, I was there several times, was back in around 1965. And, well, let's see, in terms of my own life, I had just uh, recently graduated from Johns Hopkins Medical School. I was established out in San Francisco doing my internship at San Francisco General Hospital, and I had just begun to record for Columbia Records and had had a couple of albums out by that time. And I was really pleased when Jimmy wanted me to come with my trio and play there. I was working at that time with Charlie Hayden on bass and Jerry Grinelli on drums, two just wonderful players. And I remember going down there, and it was uh, really the heat of the summer, and we played in the afternoon, which I really prefer to do at, at these kinds of festivals when there's maybe five, ten, fifteen thousand 15,000 people. There's a, a sense of contact with the people at the festival that you don't get when it's pitch dark. You just uh, you don't even see a sea of faces. It just looks totally black out there usually. And we played on Saturday afternoon, and I just remember the rapport with the audience. Uh, again, I think it's hard to get this kind of uh, rapt attention in an outdoor huge festival these days. But back then, for some reason, we could play a ballad on a Sunday afternoon for 10,000 people, and you could hear a pin drop. And that was just a marvelous experience. Wonderful memory indeed. Denny Zeitlin, may I... Uh uh, do uh, something here that's a little perhaps uh, uh, condensed and abrupt, a sort of um, word uh, Rorschach test with you. Uh-oh. Uh, just to get your reaction, if I mention John Coltrane, what do you say? Uh, he's a major influence of mine. I think he's one of the greatest musicians we've ever had in the history of jazz, certainly uh, one of the very important uh, musical influences in my whole life. Miles Davis. Similar. Those those are right at the pinnacle for me. Uh, really, in a sense, I think they've been more of an influence on my playing even than any of the pianists who initially influenced me when I began to play. I think, you know, that's kind of typical of, of players. You start out with influences on your own instrument, and then you branch out, and then it may turn out that uh, somebody on an entirely different instrument uh, really speaks to you in an even more deep way, which has been true for me, and then I'd have to really include... Other people like the great 20th century classical composers who've had an incredible influence on me. I mean, if you would mentioned Bartok and I was Popeyev up, and Stravinsky, I would have said the same thing. Well, I, I was just about to mention Ravel, Debussy, Prokofiev, yeah. Bartok. Uh, we're, we're on the same wavelength, Leah. Those, those have been just major people uh, in my past, and I guess you, you hear it in my playing, so you're, you're in tune with what I'm trying to do. And uh, you might speak to that issue of what you're trying to do. Uh, expand on that. Ooh, let's see how to summarize that in uh, a thousand words or less. <laughs> <laughs> what what I what I hope to do in terms of the actual musical content that I'm dealing with, I'm hoping to to bring together to integrate all of the diverse musical influences I've had in my life. I began at age two or three or four as an improviser and a composer, 
and then studied classical piano all the way through grade school and into the start of high school. That's when I heard jazz, and that took over my musical life. So I, I try to bring to bear all of the classical influences I've had, all the experiences in jazz, all the experiences in the 10-plus years I had where I was playing exclusively a combination of acoustic and electronic music. This was back in the late 60s when I began this and had hosts of synthesizers and electronic modules and a looked like a 747 cockpit when I was playing. And to play on that enlarged musical palette was very exciting for me. And interestingly enough, in the last 10 years, when I have found that the pendulum has swung back for me into purely acoustic music, I find that the experience I had with all the synthesizers and sound-altering equipment has somehow really improved my acoustic playing. It seems like I hear more now at the acoustic piano, which has been very important for me. So I try to bring to bear all of those influences. Uh, I've been very interested in rock and roll during that period and funk so and avant-garde music. So I hope that musically I can draw on all of those influences when I play and when I improvise. So that's a comment about the content side. On the process side of the music, I hope that when I play as much as possible, I try to enter a merger state with the music. I try to allow myself to lose even the positional sense of myself when I play. To buy, I guess it's a way of saying you try to become one with the activity. And that creates a kind of ecstatic state where I think the the highest kind of musical creativity is possible. I, I wish I could get there more often. People like John Coltrane got there to a tremendous percentage of the time. And we can aspire to that sort of consistency. I think part of the challenge of this sort of music is to allow oneself to enter that territory, and even if you slip away from it and lose track, to find ways to let yourself get back on track, which, again, allows this this kind of uh, high creativity to occur. Well, that's a... Uh, insightful statement, and I appreciate you taking time to uh, share it with our audience here. We wish you the very best of everything. Thank you, Lay. I really appreciate talking with you, and again, it's really fun to be in Minneapolis for the first time, and this is a wonderful club to play at, this artist quarter, and it's also been great having a, a marvelous seven-foot Steinway piano here, so it's uh, it's been a great time so far. I'm really having a ball. Well, it's just about time... Uh, for all of us to climb on stand with you. And um, I just want to say to the audience, there's another set to go with Dr. Denny Zeitlin, and uh, you can catch him also Sunday night at uh, around 8.15. Dr. Zeitlin, thanks very much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Lay. Nice talking with you. Good night. Good.